so good to be with you folks today. And uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. Jesus talks about true happiness. So if you have your Bible, open that with me. And um, let me read, starting with verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets uh, they pre who were before you. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now that you'll speak to our hearts and apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What is happiness to you? They say happiness is different things to different people, to uh, parents with a newborn baby, hey, that's happiness right there. Except for when they uh, wake up in uh, the middle of the night and want to be fed and changed. But uh, what is happiness to a golfer? Well, um, no way my son's brother-in-law uh, was out golfing a while back. And uh, my son and Noe, they're in the back row there. Um, I think Noe had maybe only gone golfing a few times in his entire life. And for some reason, Jonathan thought he would uh, video record one of Noe's swings. So Noe, you know, squared up to the ball and, and gave that ball a ride high in the sky. And uh, next thing he knows, the ball goes right into the cup. And he's jumping up and down and cheering and uh, a hole in one. To a golfer, happiness is a hole in one. Uh, to a gardener, gardener uh, happiness is a prized tomato. To a ballerina, happiness is leaping through the air uh, with great joy. Two robins were in a tree and... Um, they were hungry, so they thought, well, let's swoop down and get some earthworms. And there was this nice plot of ground, and uh, they just gorged themselves on those earthworms. In fact, they were so stuffed, they didn't think they could fly. So they just laid down in the dirt and just basked in the sunlight, you know. And uh, along came this tomcat, and he was licking his chops. And you know what he was thinking? He's thinking, I love Baskin Robbins. <laughs> to a tomcat, happiness is Baskin Robbins. Well, te Jesus teaches us happiness. And today our text is commonly called the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and so on. Uh, the TEV puts it happy, uh, the Greek word there is makarios, it speaks of a wonderful state of well-being and happy bliss. Makarios is used of God in 1 Timothy 1.11, where it calls God the blessed God. And God lives in a wonderful state of well-being and joyful, happy bliss. And God desires that we also live in well-being and happy 
happiness. But we need to qualify this word happy. Now, um, you know, I don't think Jesus was thinking here in terms of, you know, life being just one endless day at the beach or at Disneyland, that kind of happiness. Um, true happiness is experiencing the blessing of God upon our lives. Uh, the English word happy has at its root hap, okay, like haphazard or uh, happenstance. People equate happiness with uh, getting lucky or having good fortune, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, uh, Jesus is talking about joy. He's talking about fulfillment in life, regardless of our circumstances. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. That's happiness. Well, where can we find happiness? How can we experience God's blessing upon our lives? The Beatitudes tell us who is blessed of God and how they are blessed. And so today I'd like to look at um, half of these Beatitudes, and then next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll look at the second uh, group of Beatitudes. So the first one is found in chapter 5, verse 3. Um, let's read that together. Okay, can you read that? Let's read it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, the bliss, the happiness, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. This shakes our popular notion of what it means to be happy. Um, Alan Alda, a.k.a. Uh, Hawkeye Pierce and M.A.S.H., he quipped, it isn't necessary to be rich and famous to be happy. It's only necessary to be rich. Well, people often equate happiness with, with material wealth, as if money could buy happiness. But for Jesus, he speaks of being poor, poor in spirit. Again, people think of happiness as being free-spirited or high-spirited. Jesus says, happy are those who are poor in spirit. What does Jesus mean by poor in spirit? Well, it means a person who recognizes their need for God. In Luke chapter 18, 19 through 14, Jesus tells the parable about two men, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee was a proud, self-righteous man. Uh, he came to the temple and he prayed about himself. And he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or like this, this, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Well, the despised tax collector stood at a distance from the temple. He would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven Instead, he, he beat his chest and he prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Which of these two was poor in spirit? It was the tax collector. Which of these was blessed of God? It was the tax collector. And Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To be poor in spirit is to admit that in my own goodness, I am spiritually bankrupt. When a person declares bankruptcy, they're basically saying, I'm broke. I am in a hopeless mess. I have a debt that I cannot repay. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. Um, that's exactly 
what God wants us to admit, our spiritual bankruptcy. It's to pray, oh God, how I need you. It's to know our need for God. Uh, do you know your need for God? Uh, are you willing to admit that you cannot manage life on your own, that you need God's help every day, every hour? If so, Jesus says, you are blessed. How so? Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. We must constantly remind ourselves that this world is not our own, that we have a future home in heaven. The Beatitudes are looking to our future home, to heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we must remind ourselves that no matter how poor or needy or, or desperate we think we are sometimes, we will someday walk the streets of gold. We will someday live in God's immediate presence in heaven. So, blessed are those. Uh, those who are poor in spirit, we also need to remember that we are the children of God right now, today. Uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God speaks of God's rule, God's reign. Uh, when we are living under the lordship of Christ, uh, we are experiencing the kingdom of God right here and now, the kingdom of God that is within us and that is among us. Uh, we are enjoying the blessings of the kingdom in some way right now. Well, today we are immeasurably blessed as we turn to God in faith and as we admit our need for him. Happy, blessed are those who are humbly, who humbly acknowledge their dependence upon God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Beatitude number two, verse four, read it with me. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, this beatitude really turns our thinking upside down, doesn't it? Happy are those who mourn. Seems like a contradiction in terms. We think of grief and happiness as, as the extreme opposites. Yes, yet Jesus says, blessed, happy are those who mourn. And this word in the Greek for mourn speaks of strong, uh, passionate lament. It speaks of one who would feel uh, the loss of a spouse or, or a child. It speaks of unrestrained tears and heavy grieving. Well, what might we mourn about? We might mourn about losses in life that hit us hard. And that's only natural. When I heard the news that my dad had died, Rather unexpectedly, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I cried hard. It just hurt so very much. Dad was my, my role model. He was my rock. He was my hero. It hurt so much to lose him. Well, we may mourn over the sufferings of others. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, Mourn with those who mourn. David Schlegel shares the story on the morning of October 2nd, 2006, a troubled milkman by the name of Carl, uh, Charles Carl Roberts barricaded himself inside the West Mickel, Nickel Mine Amish school, ultimately murdering five girls and wounding six others. Robert then uh, committed suicide when the police arrived on the scene. It was a dark day for the Amish community in West Nickel Mines. But it was also a dark day for Marie Roberts, the wife of the gunman, and for her two young children. But on the day of her husband's funeral, Marie experienced something that was truly countercultural. Uh, 
despite the, the crime the man had committed, the Amish people came to mourn for Charles Carl, Charles Carl Roberts, husband and daddy. And uh, Marie, as she was there, there were half of the, uh, of the congregation, Amish people, who came and stood beside her and, and uh, mourned with her in, her own, in their own blinding grief. Bruce Porter says, a, a fire department chaplain who attended the service described what moved him most about the gesture. It's the love, the forgiveness, the heartfelt forgiveness that they had toward the family. I broke down and cried, seeing it displayed. He added that Marie Roberts was also touched. She was also, she was absolutely deeply moved by the love that was shown. And so it is, we would come alongside those who are mourning, those who are grieving. We would stand with them in their grief. We would mourn with those who mourn. Uh, here's another reason we might mourn. We might mourn over the sin we see in our world today. Psalm 119, 136, streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Do we weep over the sin we see in our world? Uh, downtown Seattle, right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people celebrating the Pride Parade. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I believe we should love and care about all people, all people, and that we should respect the basic civil rights of all people. But I believe that certain lifestyles are in violation of God's law. And rather than celebrate this, I think we should mourn. Do we weep over the other kinds of sexual sin that we see in our society, between men and women, immorality, uh, between men and women outside of marriage. Uh, do we mourn over racism? Do we mourn over pornography? Uh, do we mourn over drug trafficking, corporate greed, terrorism, crime? How about the sin we find in our own heart? Uh, isn't this cause for sin, for sorrow? James chapter 4, 8 and 9, Draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Whenever we see sinfulness in our own hearts, this should bring us godly sorrow. And godly sorrow uh, doesn't mean that we, um, you know, just um, feel sorry for ourselves. Godly sorrow means that we turn to God and we turn away from sin and turn to God in repentance. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because they will be, what? Comforted. Comforted. There's coming a day when God will wipe all tears from our eyes. Even today, we can experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the great comforter. In Isaiah chapter 61, <clears throat> 1 through 3, we read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and pro provide for those who grieve in Zion, 
to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Today, if your heart is heavy, know that God is here to comfort you. Look up to him. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's a promise from God. Let's go on to Beatitude number 3, verse 5. Read it with me, okay? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, this word meek in the Greek language speaks of being gentle, self-controlled, humble, not feisty or vengeful. Meekness is not weakness. Rather, uh, it's, a, it's a strength. Now, in our own culture, we, we take this word meek and, and um, you know, we don't see it as, as strength. We see it as a as a weakness. Uh, I remember when I was a college student in the Philippines, and I had this um, math class in the middle of the afternoon, about 3 o'clock, and it was hot, and uh, it was just, you know, and I remember I felt that I had uh, showed disrespect for the professora. So I went up to her, and I, I apologized for what I thought was disrespect shown towards her, a bad attitude. And um, she, she was surprised at my apology. She, she said that she saw me as being meek. And I, I know she meant that as a compliment, but, uh, you know, for a college young man to be called meek, well, that's just not cool, okay? Um, but... We hear that word meek, we think shy, we think, uh, you know, low self-esteem, we think, um, you know, a weakling, subservient, wimp. Uh, but the biblical word translated meek speaks of strength, speaks of being yielded to God. Uh, in, in Matthew 1, 11, 29, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Jesus was no Mamby Pamby. He was no Casper Milk Toast. He took a whip and he drove out the money changers and, and the merchants from the temple. Jesus didn't walk around with his shoulders slumped and, and uh, afraid to look a person in the eye. No, he was a man of courage and boldness. Uh, Jesus said, I am meek and lowly of heart. And he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He took that from Psalm 37, 11. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. We usually think of of the ruthless, the power hungry, the greedy as those who take over the earth. We think of Vladimir Putin uh, attacking Ukraine. But again, Jesus has a way of turning things upside down, doesn't he? He says that someday the first will be last and the last will be first. The lesson we have here is that we don't need to try to claw our way up to the top of the heap. Uh, We don't need to bully and intimidate others to get our way. Uh, We do not need to practice one-upmanship and put others down to build ourselves up. Rather, we need to yield our lives to the control of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder, have you uh, given your life to Jesus? And are you yielding it daily, moment by moment, saying, have your own way, Lord. Have your own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. This is meekness before God. We humbly yield ourselves to God and his control. Okay, we're ready for Beatitude number four, verse six. Read it with me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
William Barclay uh, says it this way, Oh, the bliss of the person who longs for total righteousness as a starving man longs for food, as a man perishing of thirst longs for water, for that person will be truly satisfied. Have you ever really been hungry or thirsty? Uh, the book Unbroken by Laura Hillebrand tells the true story of Louis Zamperini. And a few years ago, that was made into a movie. Louis was a young man who grew up in California, and uh, he competed in the Berlin Olympics. And then he went off to fight in World War II for the U.S., and his plane went down in the Pacific Ocean. He and two other guys were the only survivors of the crash. And for days, they, they floated on two small life rafts. Uh, their provisions were soon all used up, and they went for days without water and without food. Finally, they were able to catch a little bit of rainwater and a few birds and fish, but hardly anything. And all the while, uh, there were sharks that were circling around their rafts, eager for some human steaks. Well, after floating for weeks, they saw a plane high over, overhead, and they, shoot off, they shot off a flare, and uh, they hoped for rescue, but instead it was a Japanese plane that tried to shoot them out of the water. And uh, they barely uh, survived the attack. Their raft took on dozens of bullet holes. Uh, one raft was now useless. The other, while well, they were able to patch up the holes. And day after day, they drifted westward. And uh, finally, one man died of... of uh, lack of water and food. After 47 days at sea, the two emaciated men were finally rescued, or should we say captured, by the Japanese military, only to face hunger and thirst and horrible treatment in the prison camps. Well, to make a long story short, Louis survived the war and uh, came back to the States and received Jesus Christ as his Savior at a Billy Graham crusade. Well, I ask, have you ever been really hungry or thirsty? Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How so? They will be filled. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you have an insatiable appetite and thirst for righteousness? Now, what does Jesus mean by righteousness? He speaks here of godly living. It's making the great desire of our heart to live in a way that pleases God. It's the kind of living that seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. John Stott said, Biblical righteousness is more than a private and personal affair. It includes social righteousness as well. Thus, Christians are committed to hunger for righteousness in the whole community as something pleasing uh, to God. So let us hunger and thirst for honest government, ethical businesses, public morality, healthy families, wholesome entertainment, justice for the disadvantaged, fairness for the mistreated, compassion for the poor. To hunger and thirst is uh, ultimately to hunger and thirst for God. We know that just living a clean, law-abiding life is not enough. We fall short of God's glory, God's standards of right living. We all need God's intervention in our lives. We all need to receive Jesus into our lives to forgive us of our sins and to make us right before God. And then, after this, we who have been forgiven and made new 
our great hunger and thirst must be to ever draw closer to God. The psalmist prayed in Psalm 42, As the deer pants for the brooks of water, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Are you hungry and thirsty for God? Jesus said, Oh, the bliss, oh, the joy, oh, the happiness, oh, the blessing of those whose greatest desire in life is to live in fellowship and right relationship with God. They will be completely satisfied. So this morning, we, we've looked at four of the Beatitudes, four keys to happiness, we might call them. Happy, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are humbly dependent upon God, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, blessed are the meek, those who yield to God's Holy Spirit control, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. And today, are you poor in spirit? Are you, do you mourn? Are you meek? Do you hunger and thirst after God's righteousness? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you implement these virtues into your life. Uh, you know, each one of these, we need to take time to really meditate upon them, to really reflect upon, pray about them, you know, uh, to implement them. How should this affect my life today? So ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that. And as you do, you will be blessed. Uh, true happiness is found in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you'll help us to find our happiness in you. True happiness, true joy and blessing, fulfillment in our lives. Apply these truths to us, Lord, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.